for the statement, the voice to be enshrined. Thank you, Senator McCarthy. The time has expired. The time is now for questions without notice. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. If the government is doing such a good job managing the economy, why has the IMF slashed Australia's economic growth forecast to be only 1.7 per cent this year? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, thank you very much uh, uh, Madam uh, Acting uh, President. My answer to this question is uh, everybody around the world, except perhaps the Australian Labor Party, knows that we are facing significant global economic headwinds. And that, the, and that the International Monetary Fund has again downgraded global, the global economic growth outlook down to 3 per cent, the lowest, the lowest since 2008 or 2009. Now, Australia is a globally focused and globally exposed open trading economy, and when the, uh, when the global economy weakens, it has a flaw-on impact on the Australian economy. And you know what else? There's something else that everybody knows except perhaps the Australian uh, Labor Party, and that is earlier this year we had a significant flood, and we continue to have a severe drought in uh, large parts of regional Australia, which is impacting on our domestic economic growth outlook. But here, here's, here's another thing. We have a plan to deal with the challenges we're facing. We have a plan to build a stronger, more resilient economy on the back of lower taxes, more infrastructure, lower energy prices, a better access to markets around the world for exporting businesses. And you know what? We, at, the last election, at the last election, the Australian people had the opportunity to choose between two alternative plans. They were presented with a high spending, high taxing plan, which Australians understood would have weakened our economy, uh, led to higher unemployment and lower wages growth, or our plan for a stronger economy, uh, more jobs, uh, and indeed better opportunity for Australians to get ahead. Of course, we are facing global economic headwinds. Other economies around the world actually shrunk uh, in the uh, uh, last quarter, in the June quarter. Germany, the United Kingdom, uh, Singapore, and indeed if you look at the growth outlook for the G7 economies uh, in the uh, same report, uh, Australia's economic growth outlook uh, is higher than any, uh, any of those G7 economies other than the United States. Higher than any of those G7 economies uh, other than Senate the United States. Minister, please so, Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Gallagher. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. If the government has the right policy settings, then why are Australia's economic downgrades from the IMF four times worse than for advanced economies as a whole? Yeah. Yeah. Minister. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, President, uh, Madam, uh, Acting, Ma Madam Acting President. The Australian economy is into its 29th year of continuous Order. growth. Is into its 29th year of continuous growth. In fact, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. Senator Chandler uh, has never experienced anything other than a growing Australian economy. She has never, she has um, never... Minister, order. Minister, please resume your seat. Senator, order. Order. We have a point of order. We have a point of order. Senator Farrell. Uh, order. Yes, sir. Uh, Acting uh, <coughs> President. Um, uh, the standing orders require that the, that the leader address the chair. I've noticed he's got his back. He's back to, turned away from you on every occasion. Could you please direct him to address the chair in accordance with the standing orders? Thank you, Senator Farrell. And I'm sure uh, Minister Cormann is well aware of the standing orders. Um, Minister, please continue. Thank you very much. And of course, in addressing uh, you, Madam Acting Deputy President, let me, let me continue to make this point. Senator Chandler has Order. never experienced anything other than a growing, than a growing Australian economy. A growing Australian Order. economy. What she has never experienced, what she has never experienced is a labour surplus. She has never experienced a labour surplus. So our, our government stands by the plan for a stronger economy, which of course includes making sure that the Australian government lives within its means because that is an important part an important part of making sure that our economy is as resilient as possible into the future. Thank you, Minister. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. Minister, why do you pretend the economy is strong when the IMF's World Economic Outlook predicts Australia's growth for this year will be slower than the US, Spain and New Zealand? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, um, Madam Acting uh, Deputy President. 
the Australian economy has gone through 20, uh, since its 29th year of continuous growth. We are only one of 10 AAA rated economies. AAA rated economies. We are, of course, we are exposed to things like global trade tensions, and I mean that is that is something that everybody uh, understands. And we are, of course, uh, implementing a plan to deal with the challenges that we're facing. But let me also just uh, make the point again: wages growth. I mean, Labour, Labour hasn't been asking questions uh, on wages growth today. But I know why, because yesterday they fi finally realised that wages growth in Australia in the last financial year was the highest it's been since 2013-14. It's higher. It, Real wages growth is higher than it was when Labor lost government, and indeed is higher than the long-term average, the long-term 20-year average of 0.6 per cent. So, I mean, if the, if the Labor Party was really, if the Labor Party was really interested, they would they would back Thank our you, plan Minister. for the time a stronger for that economy and more jobs. Has expired. Before I go to Senator Antic, I draw the attention of the gallery to honourable senators, um, the presence in the chamber of a parliamentary delegation from the Socialist Republic of Vietnam, led by the member of the Standing Committee of the Ho Chi Minh Communist Youth Union, Mr Nguyen Minh Thrite. On behalf of all senators, I wish you a warm welcome to Australia and, in particular, to the Senate. Yeah. Senator Antic. My question is to the minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Cormann. Can the minister update the Senate on the global economic challenges outlined by the IMF in their World Economic Outlook released last night and outline how the Australian economy remains resilient and continues to grow? Minister, thank, sorry. thank you very much, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, I am pleased to report that the fundamentals of the Australian economy remain sound. We are in our 29th year of consecutive economic growth, a record unmatched by any other developed economy. We are one of only 10 economies in the world with a AAA credit uh, rating by all three major credit ratings agencies. We have a record workforce participation rate with a record number of Australians in paid employment, with more than 1.4 million new jobs created since we came to office. Wages growth in 2018-19, the strongest since 2013-14. Real wages growth at 0.7 per cent, stronger than the long-term 20-year average of 0.6 per cent, and higher than the 0.4 per cent real growth during Labor's last year in office. Welfare dependency uh, is at its lowest in three decades. But yes, we are facing a series of headwinds. The IMF has again downgraded global growth forecasts down to 3 per cent, the lowest growth forecast since 2008 or 9. Australia is a globally focused and globally exposed trading economy. Lower global growth has an inevitable impact on our domestic economy. Then we had the floods in North Queensland. Labor forgot about those. Then this, and of course, we do have severe drought impacting on large parts of regional Australia. On the international front, the IMF's most recent report highlights these challenges, saying, and I quote, Rising trade and geopolitical tensions are taking a toll on business confidence, investment decisions and global trade. But unlike the advanced economies of Germany, the United States, Sweden and Singapore, which contracted in the June quarter, the Australian economy continued to grow. In fact, the IMF forecasts that Australia will grow faster than any, other G than any of the G7 economies over the next two years except Order. the US. But the international, the international challenges are a reminder of why Order. we must continue to stick to our balanced and disciplined economic plan. Thank you, Minister. The time plan. has expired. Senator Antic, your first supplementary. Thank you. In the face of these global challenges, can the minister please explain how the government's plan is helping the economy to grow and create jobs? Minister. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, that's a very important question. We knew in April, when we delivered the budget, that we were facing these uh, global economic headwinds. We knew about some of the downside risks in the domestic economy. And that is, of course, why we put forward a balanced and disciplined economic plan to support our economy and create jobs by delivering lower taxes. And this Senate, of course, uh, has helped pass $300 billion worth of income tax relief, putting more money into the pockets of hardworking Australians, giving, ensuring that hardworking Australians have got higher take-home pay, something the Labor Party clearly uh, is not interested in. Is not interested in. Uh, the tax cuts are already flowing through. Order. More than $20 billion in tax refunds being put back into the pockets of hardworking Australians over the last two and a half months. 
Our plan also backs small and medium-sized business. We have reduced uh, the, uh, tax, the corporate tax rate for small and medium-sized businesses with a turnover of uh, up to $50 million, and indeed providing— Thank you, uh, Minister. The time has expired. There is more. Senator Antic, a second supplementary order. Oh, thank you. Uh, um, Senator Antic, just wait a moment. Order. Order. Senator Wong, um, Senator Antic. Your if, second supplementary. Uh, I'd like to know what are the risks of not sticking to the government's economic plan. Minister. Thank you very much, but I'm acting uh, president. Order. Let me, let me inform Wong. the Senate. Let me inform the Senate that in uh, their great wisdom, the Australian people actually chose to avoid the greatest risk that the Australian economy was facing earlier this year by voting for the re-election of the Liberal National Government. Because the Australian people knew that the alternative agenda that was being put forward, a tax and spend agenda, which the Labor Party is still pushing today, would have made our economy weaker, would have led to higher unemployment and lower wages over time. They knew that our plan, our plan of lower taxes, of an ambitious free trade agenda to help our exporting businesses get better access to key markets around the world, bringing electricity prices down and indeed running funding a $100 billion record infrastructure investment pipeline was the right way for Australia to go in the context of the global economic headwinds and the downside risks in the domestic economy that we knew were coming. Uh, your time has expired. Thank you, Minister. Senator McCarthy. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Since the government was re-elected in May, the RBA has downgraded Australia's growth outlook for this year. The OECD has downgraded Australia's growth outlook for this year by twice as much as the downgrades for the G20 as a whole. And the IMF has downgraded Australia's growth outlook for this year by four times more than downgrades for advanced economies as a whole. If our growth outlook has changed so substantially, why haven't the government's policies? Minister. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. You know why? Because unlike the Rudd and Gillard Labor governments, uh, who panicked uh, in the face of uh, and blew the budget, the Rudd and uh, Gillard Labor governments, which panicked and blew the budget and weakened the Australian uh, economic and fiscal position to this day uh, compared to what it would have been, we know the importance of sticking to the plan. We will stick to the plan which we know will build a stronger, more resilient Australian economy into the future. We will not be panicked. We will not be pushed around by Labor who still can't get used to the fact that the Australian people rejected your high taxing, high spending, anti-business, anti-aspiration, socialist agenda at the last election. Senator McCarthy, a first supplementary. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I refer to comments made by the IMF that monetary policy cannot be the only game in town. This echoes the repeated calls by the RBA that it cannot do all the heavy lifting solely with monetary policy. Why is the Morrison government stubbornly ignoring the warnings of the RBA and IMF to support the economy by bringing forward essential infrastructure investment. Minister. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Madam Minister. Acting Deputy President. Uh, I reject the premise of the question. Monetary policy is not the only game in town. Of course we have a pro-growth budget, a budget with uh, $300 billion worth of income tax relief over the next decade, uh, including $20 billion that was paid out to Australians, returning their money uh, to them over the last two and a half two and a half months, including a $100 billion infrastructure pipeline. And indeed, the Prime Minister has written to all state government uh, premiers and chief ministers, territory chief ministers, uh, to invite them uh, to uh, work with us uh, to bring forward uh, it, the execution of infrastructure projects where that is a sensible thing to do. We will not do what the Labor Party did and put a billion dollars worth of uh, pink bats into people's roofs, setting houses on fire, to then spend a billion dollars to take them out again. We will not be wasting money on school halls that uh, schools around Australia by and large didn't Order. actually need, a complete and utter waste Order. of money. We will continue to make sensible decisions uh, in order to, uh, of Thank course, you, continue Minister. to build Your a stronger economy. Expired. Senator McCarthy, a second supplementary. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Former Liberal Treasurer Peter Costello has warned that, and I quote, we are running a monetary policy that can only be described as being at emergency levels. 
Given Mr Costello is the second former Liberal Treasurer to describe current interest rates as being at emergency levels, how much longer will it be before the government finally takes action to support the economy? Minister. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Madam, Acting Madam Acting President. Uh, the Australian government is taking action. The Australian government has a pro-growth budget, and we put our pro-growth budget to the Australian people. And you know what? The Australian people gave it the tick, and they, they made a decision that your agenda was reckless and that our agenda was the better agenda for the economy and for Australian families wanting to get ahead. Uh, you know, former treasurers have got liberty to talk, to comment about monetary policy. I leave monetary policy to the Reserve Bank. It is entirely a matter for the Reserve Bank to independently assess what they believe the appropriate monetary policy settings should be. We will continue to make decisions on fiscal policy. And I say to you again, guess what? We were elected at the last election to implement our plan. We will be implementing our plan. We'll continue to make decisions on fiscal policy settings into the future as appropriate, and we will not take any lectures from the Labor Party who would have put the Australian economy into a much weaker position as a result of their high taxing, high spending Thank agenda, you, which was rejected by the Australian expired. people. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, Thank you, Madam Deputy President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Water, Drought and Natural Resources, Senator Mackenzie. Uh, Senator, do you accept the science and acknowledge that there is a link between climate change and drought? Minister. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Deputy President, and I thank Senator Hanson Young for her question. It seems that we're actually playing merry-go-rounds here. I've been very, very clear that Australian farmers, the Australian government, uh, those of us that are involved in food and fibre production in this country, accept the science of climate change. And that means when we have variabilities in the climate that we have right now, it's not unusual for Australia to be in drought. It's unusual for it to be as devastating as this one is. Uh, but it's not unusual. So to say that um, climate change per se in the present has been responsible for all of the droughts that our country has been through over the last two centuries and, and previously is a long bow to draw. But if you're trying to somehow make out that I don't accept the science of climate change, you'll be hard pressed if you search Hansard or any of my public comments to find that data, because you won't. We accept the science of climate change. We've got a strong package of measures that we took to the federal election to address it, not just in my own portfolio of agriculture, but in Angus Taylor's um, energy McKenzie, portfolio. Senator McKenzie, please resume your seat. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, just a point of order. The question was whether she, the minister accepts the science and acknowledges there is a link between climate change and drought. I'd like, a quest I'd like an answer to that question. I do believe the minister is being relevant, um, but she's got 45 seconds uh, to answer the question with more detail if she chooses. Minister. Well, thank you very much, uh, Madam Deputy President. I don't think I actually could have been clearer. So why don't I talk about the future drought fund and the $5 billion that we have put into that to actually assist farmers and communities, not, not today, not today, but over the coming years, address climate change and address their resilience and their businesses' resilience to the fact that we will be seeing droughts, heat waves, etc., in this country. That's the reality. That's why we've actually put money, real money, on the table to assist communities and industry going forward to be more resilient in the face of climate change. Thank you, Senator McKenzie. Um, Senator Hanson Young, a second. Uh, first thank you, Madam Deputy President. Um, seeing, Minister, that you do accept the science on climate change, do you agree then that climate change is exacerbated, is exacerbating the drought, and that with every ton of coal dug and burned, it is making conditions worse uh, for our farmers? It's making life worse for our rural communities, and it's making things worse for the Murray-Darling Basin. Minister. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Deputy President. Well, Senator Hanson, when I young, when I head out to re rural and regional Australia, and I am talking to farmers that are suffering from the worst drought our country has seen, one of the things they talk to me about a lot is the cost of electricity. And we know 
uh, that particularly if you're a dairy farmer, uh, you can have input costs high because of the cost of grain at the moment, because of the drought. You have increased costs of water uh, because of the drought. And we also have high input costs when it comes to electricity prices, which is affecting their profitability at the end of the line. When input costs go up and you're not getting much more for your product, you know what? You have less money. And so you are doing it tough. You are, dairy farmers are doing it tough. They're doing it tough because of the price of electricity, amongst other import costs. Our government is committed to getting that down, and that means thank supporting you, Minister, reliable supply. Thank you, Minister. The time supply. has expired. Senator Hanson Young, a uh, second supplement. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. Um, um, Minister, uh, you didn't uh, address the uh, link between climate change and drought. But have, let me put this to you: Your drought policy is to build drams and to pray for rain. Do you accept that until your government gets a policy on climate change, you've got no policy on drought at all? Minister. On drought and what is good for regional Australia by that mob over there is absolutely obscene. For you to stand up, I could shut down every coal-fired power station today, right now, and I tell you what, Sarah, we'd still be in drought. Um, Our farmers minister, would still be minister, doing it tough. Minister, I remind you to address the senator uh, sorry, in front of Sorry, Madam title. Deputy President. Um, but you know, it's a bit of a joke. Very rich, again playing politics for Fitzroy, Brunswick, and the like. Thank you very much. So when we say it's a beautiful, it's leafy Elwood. It's leafy Elwood. Um, but for you to come in here and lecture us on how to deal with the drought and that if we switched off all coal-fired power stations in this country today, that somehow miraculously it would rain tomorrow. That's right. That's right. You know, I mean, it's just a joke. I believe the science, and I know what science will tell me, it will tell me that won't happen. Um, Senator McKenzie, please resume happen. your seat. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, point of order, Madam Deputy President. The only person talking about miracles in this place is the minister who says we just Senator should pray Hansen for rain. Young, that's a debating point. Thank you, Minister. You know what, Senator Hanson Young? I'm not the only one praying for rain. There's a lot of people in regional Australia praying for rain. There's a lot of people Thank across you, this minister, country praying for rain. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Order. Order. Senator D. Smith. Thank, Thank you, you, Madam Deputy President. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Can the Minister please update the Senate on the importance of the government's economic plan to support targeted, comprehensive and sustainable welfare system? Minister. Mm. Thank you very much, and I thank Senator Smith for his question. We all know that social services touches most Australians at some time in their lives, and invariably it's when they are at their most vulnerable, which is why it is absolutely critical, absolutely critical that our social security system remains sustainable so that we can continue to provide the support that Australians need when they are most in need. We make a promise to Australians that if they need a particular, if they find themselves in particularly different, difficult circumstances, we will provide them with the support that they need as long as they reach, uh, achieve the eligibility requirements, and they will be supported for as long as they need it. And if we make that promise, we will keep that promise. Because on this side of the chamber, we never want to run the risk of running out of money so that we aren't in a position to be able to continue to pay the benefits that we have promised the Australian public that we will. And for those opposite, in case you um, for some information, at present, um, the bottom 20 per cent of households actually receive the highest amount of social assistance benefit of anyone. And it is the responsibility of this government to ensure that our social security and welfare system is sustainable into the future so that we can continue to provide the support for those that need it. Because we believe that the social security system is a way more uh, detailed than just, worrying, uh, just dealing with the safety net payments. It's about creating jobs. 1.4 million jobs since we came into government. It's about creating pathways for those jobs, about breaking down the barriers that Australians face when they're trying to get a job. We have a myriad of different programs that we are in the marketplace at the moment successfully pro um, uh, dealing with to make sure that we get people into work. The sustainability of our social security system relies on a strong economy, and that's what we Thank have. You, Minister. Senator Smith, your first supplementary. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Can the minister advise the Senate of Australia's welfare trends? Minister. 
Thank you very much, uh, Madam Deputy President. The proportion of Australians on working age income support payments have actually fallen to their lowest level in 30 years at 14.3 per cent. Under this government, there are 230,000 fewer working age recipients on income support between June 2014 and June 2018. There have been significant decreases in all types of payments over that period, but one that I think is particularly important and worth mentioning in this chamber is a 26.8 per cent reduction in the number of youth allowance payments. That is a massive increase in the number of young Australians who find themselves now in work or studying. Since becoming the minister, I've had the privilege of seeing a number of the programs that are in the workplace that are actually working to get young people into work. They're assisting young people to, uh, to deal with their situation, and it's through the strong economic management and the strong economy that we continue to be able to deliver Thank these you, programs. Thank you, Minister. Senator Smith, your second supplementary. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Can the minister update the Senate on the long-term sustainability of the welfare system? Minister. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy President. Um, while the, the population in Australia has grown over the last year, the total number of people who rely on welfare has decreased. Um, so, while um, you know, and the data from the soon-to-be-released data from the Priority Investment Approach will actually reveal that there has been a significant reduction in the long-term or the lifetime costs of Australia's welfare system. $5.7 trillion over the lifetime, as opposed to $6.3 trillion. That's a 10.1 per cent decrease in the amount of money that is going to be required of taxpayers' money to fund our social services system into the future. And that is a saving that will underpin the sustainability of our welfare system, not just now, but for future generations. We cannot borrow of future generations to pay for welfare of today. So our strong economy allows us to keep our promise to Australians that when they fall on hard times, we will be there to support them. It's a promise a thank strong economy Thank you, Minister. Allows. Your time has expired. Thank Senator Griff. Yes, thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. My question is to Senator Cash, representing the Minister for Health. Recently, I had major surgery but had to be readmitted to hospital via its emergency department a few hours later after I was discharged. The readmission was due to significant bleeding, which the ED doctor stated was due to me being given the wrong combination of post-op drugs. Medical errors are a major cause of death and ill health in Australia, with the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare reporting that hospital-acquired complications in 2017-18 alone uh, occurred in 185,000 people. Can the minister explain what actions the Department of Health is taking to reduce the tide of hospital-acquired complications in Australia, particularly given that it has been around that 180 to 190,000 figure for a number of years. Thank you, Senator Griff. Minister. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President, and I thank Senator Griff for the question and for providing me with some notice. Uh, but can I also acknowledge the personal experience uh, that you have recently had? Uh, but also, I think, on behalf of all senators, warmly welcome you back uh, to the Australian Senate. Um, Australia does have, as we know, one of the best health systems in the world, and it is supported by dedicated clinicians who work hard to ensure that their patients receive safe and high-quality care. As you have outlined, though, uh, in relation to your own personal experience, things can go wrong, and ongoing work is needed to reduce the impact of adverse events on Australian patients and their families. The Australian Commission on Safety and Quality in Healthcare provides support and guidance to clinicians in the management and improvement of hospital-acquired complications. A national list of hospital-acquired complications has been developed by clinicians to support hospitals in monitoring public safety. This list provides a subset of hospital-acquired complications that were prioritised by clinicians based on preventability patient impact severity, health service impact and clinical priority. Uh, in the National Health Reform Agreement, jurisdictions, because obviously a lot of this is primarily the states and territories, uh, they have agreed to improve patient outcomes for hospital-acquired complications, to incentivise patient safety and quality through improved patient outcomes, hospital funding is reduced for any episode of admitted acute care 
where a hospital-acquired complication occurs. This reduced funding is then used by the state or territory governments to deliver safety and quality improvement programs to support clinicians to deliver better patient outcomes. Thank you, Minister. Senator Griff, your first supplementary. Most errors, uh, Minister, occur when medical personnel are hungry, angry, late or tired, which is known as the HALT syndrome. The pilot that flew me here from Adelaide has regulated hours, train and long-distance truck drivers have regulated hours. Why is it that doctors and nurses, both in the public and private system, do not have maximum safe regulated working hours? Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, uh, Madam, Madam Deputy President. Um, Senator Griff, again, safety and quality in hospitals is primarily the responsibility of states and territories, but certainly the Australian government supports the states and territories in improving hospital quality and safety by funding jointly the Australian Commission on Safety and Quality Care in Healthcare. In relation to the incentivisation um, that I previously talked, uh, referred to, can I just also add the strength in data collection that it has actually acquired and the reporting measures to support clinicians uh, in learning and decision making is a key element of these measures. So there is a lot of work being done. There are mechanisms in place, and the Australian government works with the states and territories again to ensure that patients are receiving safe and high quality care. Because ultimately, our clinicians are dedicated. Thank you, Minister. And they... The time for answering the questions has expired. Senator Griff, your second supplementary. Accountants have international accounting standards. Manufacturers have ISO standards. Will the government commit to developing clinical health care standards that govern diagnosis? treatment and rehabilitation and that best utilise uh, practice evidence. Minister. Uh, thank you. And again, in answering that question, I would make the point, because I think it is a point that we need to reiterate, Australia does have one of the best healthcare systems in the world, and it is supported by dedicated clinicians who work hard to ensure that their patients receive safe and high quality care. In relation to your further question, I'll have to refer that to the Minister. Thank you, Minister. Senator McMahon. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. My question is to the Minister for Agriculture, Senator McKenzie. Can the Minister please tell us what are the benefits to Australian farmers and the wider community of having a strong biosecurity system? Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Deputy President. And I thank Senator McMahon as a vet uh, for her question and know she has a strong interest in uh, a robust border security system. Biosecurity underpins $60 billion worth of our agricultural production and $49 billion worth of agricultural exports, each vital contributors to jobs and growth, particularly in regional and rural Australia. Such as the, when we get biosecurity breaches, such as the carpet beetle, uh, that could cost Australia $1.47 billion dollars per year over a 20-year period, or the dreaded foot and mouth disease, which could absolutely devastate our $16 billion livestock industry. For those of us that care about the profitability and resilience of rural and regional Australia and indeed the national economy, having a robust 21st century biosecurity system is absolutely paramount. But it's not just protecting our agricultural industries. It's also our $6 trillion worth of environmental assets, our animal and uh, human health. One in five jobs in Australia are actually related to uh, trade, and a tough biosecurity system actually protects our reputation as a trading nation on the global stage. Our pest and disease-free status is iconic and unique, and it really underpins the value of so much of the products that we export to the world. Uh, we will not take a backward step when it comes to keeping our borders safe uh, from pests and disease, whether it be the brown marmorated stink bug of last year, the things I didn't know 140 days ago, brown marmorated stink bug, uh, almost incursion last year that saw ships turned away, to the outbreak of African swine fever that we've watched march uh, you know, across Europe and through Southeast Asia, ending uh, you know, at the moment Timor-Leste, 650 kilometres from Darwin, we will not take a backward step from keeping our borders secure. Uh, Senator McMahon, your first supplementary. Thank you. Can the minister update the Senate about how the coalition government's economic plan is helping to defend Australia 
against African swine fever. Minister. Thank you. And thank you, Senator McMahon. Well, when you have a strong economic plan, you can do a whole lot of things, like respond to risks to the economy which would be incurred if we got African swine fever onshore. We are protecting our 2,700 pig producers, the 36,000 Australians that work in uh, the pork industry, and making sure that this disease, which kills 80 per cent of the pigs that it infects, from our shores. It means when you've got uh, the financial resources at your disposal, you can uh, send Suki to Darwin to actually check the nine direct flights from Dili uh, when you need to. You can actually ramp up the inspections at the border, increase your x-raying of uh, parcels from uh, affected countries. and Through those measures, we've been able to detect and stop over 27 tonnes of cooked pork product from affected ASF countries from reaching our shore. It's that responsiveness that we need. Thank you, Senator McKenzie. Senator McMahon, your second supplementary. Thank you. Can the minister advise the Senate on risks to our strong biosecurity system? Minister. Thank you very much. Uh, Senator McMahon, yes, I can uh, talk about the risks. And the risks to our biosecurity system are complacency. Complacency from industry, complacency from importers, complacency from travellers and people that would seek to think it's okay to bring uh, that home cooked sausage into your uh, son or daughter who may be studying at one of our great institutions, that you think it's okay. Uh, that you won't be able to purchase high quality food here in Australia, so you pack your suitcase uh, full of cooked pork product, some quail eggs, uh, maybe some squid, and away you go. What we found on the weekend was that, yes, squid. So on the weekend, uh, a woman from Vietnam arrived on our shores with over 10 kilos of material, which was significant biosecurity breach. She breached our, um, our legislation and we have sent her back to Vietnam thank and she you, won't Senate. be the last. Thank you, Minister. Though your time has expired. Senator Bernardi. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. My question is to the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. A constituent in my state runs a training organisation employing 16 South Australians. This constituent was recently audited by the Australian Skills Quality Authority for registration. While the audit found high satisfaction from students and re-registration was granted, my constituent was concerned about how ASQA communicated with him as a small business owner. The minor issues that the audit identified as needing attention resulted in him receiving a letter threatening to shut him down. When he questioned the Commissioner as to why ASQA responds in such a heavy-handed manner, he was told, and I quote, legislation requires it to be so. Could the minister advise what part of the legislation makes it necessary for ASQA to intimidate and threaten the livelihoods of training providers rather than work with them to identify and rectify any breaches of their onerous and overly bureaucratic compliance systems? Thank you, Senator Bernardi. Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Bernardi for his question um, and for providing me with some notice of it. But I also acknowledge uh, your keen interest in small business uh, and, in particular, in relation to skills training. Uh, Senator Bernardi, uh, you would be aware that the Morrison government is committed to a strong vocational education and training sector that delivers quality training to the students. It is critical that the VET sector is properly regulated so that the training providers are delivering training that is appropriate. I want every vet student to have confidence that when they make a choice to do vocational training, that their training provider will deliver the quality training they need to complete their apprenticeship or traineeship and to be job ready. Quality vocational training, uh, as you understand, is critical to our economy, and a vet qualification, again, uh, as you will be aware, is just as relevant, just as valuable as a university degree. As the vet regulator, ASQA is responsible for maintaining this quality and, where warranted under the legislation, taking regulatory action. It is critical that our regulator follow standard regulatory procedures so that training providers are afforded the principles of natural justice and that decisions are supported by sound evidence. 
Both of the major reviews, the VET reviews, commissioned by the government, both the Joyce Review and the Braithwaite Review, have also made it clear that to pr improve the quality of training, ASQA requires reform. This includes ASQA having a much stronger guidance and educative role and greater levels of transparency, as you have referred to, around ASQA decision making. I am working with the states and territories and stakeholders to implement these recommendations to reform ASQA as a top priority. Thank you, Minister. Senator Bernardi, your first supplementary. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Minister, we all know that unscrupulous operators rorted the VET system until changes were made by the government. But the onerous red tape and compliance that is now required is an impediment to small business owners who run training organisations being able to actually deliver the best and most effective results. What will the government do specifically to support small business operators like my constituent to more efficiently deal with their compliance organisations? Minister. Uh, thank you, Senator Bernardi. And I have to say, red tape reduction and simplification uh, is a passion for this side of politics. Um, the educative role, though, of ASQA is incredibly important. That's certainly based on, I know, the feedback that you have received from your constituents and certainly the feedback that I have received, but also the feedback uh, that state and territory skills ministers have received. And we discussed this at our recent uh, skills ministers meeting. The educative role that ASQA is adopting will ensure, and it's deliberately designed to ensure, that small business owners are better supported to understand their compliance obligations. Because often it is just a misunderstanding of what they need to do that means they are then in breach of the legislation. Um, at a recent meeting, as I said, of Commonwealth and State Skills Ministers, uh, and this includes both Labor uh, and Coalition Ministers, it was unanimously agreed that it was important for ASQA to adopt an educative role. Uh, this will be a significant step— Thank you, Minister. The time for answering the question has expired. Senator Bernardi, a second supplementary. Uh, thank you. Uh, Minister, government should be an ally and not an enemy of small business. Will the government commit to ensuring a productive relationship between training providers and the regulator that is essential to the confidence and effectiveness of our skills and training sector? rather than the adversarial one experienced by my constituent and other training providers. Minister. Uh, thank you. Uh, and again, Senator Bernardi, uh, this goes directly what, to what was agreed uh, by the skills ministers at their most recent meeting, um, that it was unanimously agreed that it is so important for ASQA to adopt an educative role and actually work with uh, many of the small um, uh, RTOs. Uh, this is a significant step. It is a significant step which the government believes will benefit every stakeholder in the, in the VET sector, uh, including students, uh, registered training organisations uh, and employers. Uh, the government obviously will you know, assist ASQA in improving its regulatory approach. We will support ASQA to ensure audit decisions are transparent and training providers have the right support to deliver quality training. Thank you, Minister. Senator Ayres. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Youth uh, and Sport, Senator Colbeck. Uh, the youth unemployment rate in the Southern Highlands and the Shoalhaven in my home state of New South Wales is 20.5%. With the IMF slashing Australia's economic growth forecasts to be only 1.7% in 2019 and 2.3% in 2020, it's in the other folder. What is the minister doing to assist young people looking for work in New South Wales? Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. The one thing that we are doing, Mr. Pre uh, sorry, Deputy, Deputy President. Deputy President. The one thing we are doing is to ensure that we keep the fundamentals of the Australian economy strong. That's what we're doing. So that every young Australian has the opportunity for employment. As I explained yesterday, we've got a number of employment programs in place to assist young people to work their way through the system. But if, if as the Labor Party projected at the last election to impose $387 billion worth of new taxes on the Australian economy. Where would the Australian economy be today? And how much of that did they put into youth programs? How much of that $387 billion in new taxes did they project into new 
tax program, uh, youth programs. They, they actually voted to remove youth programs that we've put into place. So, Madam De uh, Deputy President, I don't intend to be lectured by the Labor Party with respect to how we manage the Australian economy. Uh, we have said that we will continue to maintain our economic set settings by keeping the economy strong, uh, despite the global headwinds that have been projected by the IMF, uh, and in those circumstances, by opening um, up new Minister, markets— Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Ayres. On relevance, Madam Deputy President, uh, I wondered if perhaps the minister might be able to find in his folder one relevant point that he could make in relation to young people in the Southern Highlands uh, and in the Shoalhaven, whose youth unemployment rate is 20 per cent. Uh, thank you, Senator Ayres. Um, yes, Minister. O on, on the point of order, the minister has been entirely directly uh, relevant. Um, uh, no no Coleman, amount of condescending commentary will hide the fact that the minister was directly relevant. Thank you. Um, Minister, you were being broadly relevant. Um, part of the question was directly related to the Shoalhaven. Um, I'll just remind you of that. Thank you. Please continue. Th thank you, Madam Deputy President. The point, of order, the point of order clearly demonstrates that the Labor Party clearly do not understand the link between the economy and the capacity of young Australians, or any Australian for that matter, to get a job. If, that's, if, if, if raising a porter such as that, if raising a point of order such as that is their demonstration of understanding of how their view relates to the strength um, of— Minister, please resume your seat. Order. Just a moment, Minister. Wait for the call. Order. Minister. Uh, interjections are disorderly, uh, and like this is even to another level of disorder. I ask you to call the leader of the opposition uh, to, uh, to order. She's been harassing the minister who's been trying to answer the question. Um, thank you, Senator Cormann. On the same point of order, Senator Wong, order. <laughs> I need to be able to hear the point of order. Uh, uh, on the Wong. point of order, I will always respond to whoever's in the chair's call and call to order. I, I would have to say I thought I'd been very gentle today with this minister. We have one in five young people unemployed in this region. Perhaps treat the question with some respect. Thank you. If it's a debating point, thank you, Minister. I've identified that as a debating point. I do remind all senators that um, the minister does have the right to be heard in silence and that interjections are disorderly. Minister, please continue your response. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. The Labor Party can run all the points of order they like. They can make all the personal comments that they like after complaining Thank about Thank you, Minister. Your time yesterday. has expired. Senator Ayres, your first supplementary. I'll, I'll try somewhere else, uh, Madam Deputy President. The youth unemployment rate in outback Queensland is 24 per cent. With the IMF slashing Australia's growth outlook by more than global growth, and four times more than the advanced economies as a whole, what is the minister doing to assist young people looking for work in outback Queensland? Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, sorry, Madam Deputy President. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. As I said yesterday, the un youth unemployment rate is too high. We acknowledge that. But the youth unemployment in Australia now is lower than what it was when Labor left office. It is 1 per cent lower than what it was when it left office. That's why we put into place programs like the PATH program I spoke yesterday, which is to assist young people uh, get into jobs. And, and also um, the Minister, to work Minister program. please resume your seat. Order. Order. I need to be able to hear Senator Colbeck answer the questions. Order. Minister, please continue. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. That's why we've put in places, place projects like the PATH program that the Labor Party voted against to assist young people to get into work. And yesterday they're complaining about the fact that 30 per cent of those people are actually ending up in a job. That's why we have the Transition to Work program, which helps people who drop out of the system to get back into the system. And I was talking to some of those young people just this morning to assist to work to get back into the program when they're when they're falling through the system. And Minister, your time has expired. Senator Ayres, your second supplementary. The youth unemployment rate across the Barossa, York and Mid-North in South Australia 
is 24.7 per cent. What hope do young people in the Barossa, York and Mid-North, struggling to find a secure, well-paid job have when the IMF is predicting a weaker economy in Australia than the US, Spain and New Zealand? Minister. Thank you, Deputy President. They have a damn sight better prospect of getting a job under the, under the economy the way that we're managing it, rather than having an economy that had the imposition of $387 billion of additional taxes. They have a much better chance of getting a job under this government than they did under them. And the youth unemployment rate now is 1 per cent lower than it was when they le left office. And that's due to the programs that we're putting in place to assist young people to get into jobs and to get, to get employment. And by maintaining our strong economic settings, Madam Deputy President, we will continue to provide the opportunities. By opening up new trade markets that we're doing through free trade agreements, we'll provide new opportunities for industry and business to grow jobs, particularly in regional Australia. It would be nice if the Labor Party Order. indicated their support or otherwise of those free trade agreements because it's been one of the things that's assisted this country Thank to you, grow Minister. its economy the since we came to government. The question has expired. Before we move to the next um, question, I advise senators that former senator from South Australia, uh, Mr Grant Chapman, is in the gallery this afternoon. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. Will the Minister update the Senate on what life-changing cancer medications will now be made available on the Pharmaceutical Benefits Scheme? Minister. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Oh, Madam Deputy President, and can I just say I think that this is without a doubt one of the proudest achievements uh, of the coalition government, and I certainly know it is one of the proudest achievements uh, of the Minister for Health, and that is, of course, being able to utilise the benefits of a strong economy to actually put drugs onto the pharmaceutical benefits scheme, but in particular life-changing cancer medications. Uh, I don't think anybody in here would say that they have not personally uh, been touched by cancer or alternatively know someone who is very close to them uh, that has been touched by cancer. We have, as a result of uh, the dividends of a strong economy, or the minister has, recently listed medicines to treat lung cancer, lymphoblastistic and acute leukaemia, and the nausea associated with chemotherapy. Uh, chemotherapy. Affected more than half a million patients. That's a good dividend. But we have also are saving them up to $100,000 per course of treatment. We have also listed to Centric and Avastin. This will help a number of patients suffering with certain types of lung cancers. Now, without the PBS subsidy, access to this life-changing medicine would cost patients more than $11,400 per script or more than $189,100 per course of treatment. We have also extended the listing of Besponza. This will assist many patients suffering from lymphoblastic and acute leukaemia. Again, without the listing of this drug, patients would pay more than $44,500 per script or more than $122,900 per uh, course of treatment. That is why we have a plan. That is why we will not deviate from our plan, because these are real dividends you, of the benefits the of a strong the question economy. Has expired. Senator Hughes, a first supplementary. Thank you. To what extent are these listings the consequence of our economic plan? Minister. Well, again, this is all about the dividends of a strong economy. Since being elected to government in 2013, our government, the coalition government, has invested $10.6 billion to make over 2,200 new or amended medicine listings on the pharmaceutical benefits scheme. We're averaging around 31 new or amended listings per month. That now equates to approximately one per day. Many <laughs> medicines would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars per year, and let's be frank, they would be out of reach for many. But because of our management of the economy, we are able to make these listings and patients will pay $40.30 
or $6.50 per script. Again, we understand on this side of the chamber the benefits of a strong economy, and one of those benefits is being able to list drugs on the PBS. Thank you, Minister. Senator Hughes, a second supplementary. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Is the minister aware of any alternative approaches to managing the pharmaceutical benefits scheme? Minister. Um, I will take Senator Billick's interjection. I acknowledge everything that Senator Billick went through, and it is so fantastic to have you here. In a few weeks' time, my little sister's anniversary comes up, four years to the day that she lost her life from cancer. The drugs she needed we're not on the PBS. So my family did everything we could to ensure that she was able to access, no matter what the drug was, we did everything. We did everything we could so she could access those drugs. And what did we do in return? We bought some time to create memories. So please, these are the benefits of a strong economy. This is a government that gets out there and does deliver for Australians. And access to life-saving drugs should never be made political. We should always deliver for Australians and access to benefits, and including life-changing drugs for cancer. That is a dividend of a strong economy. Thank you, Minister. Senator Billett. Thank you, Ms. Um, Ad Madam Deputy President. My question is to the Minister for Youth and Sport, Senator Colbeck. I refer to the Grattan Institute report, Generation Gap, Ensuring a Fair Go for Younger Australians. Can the minister confirm that half of all households headed by someone younger than 35 have experienced one or more indicators of financial stress, such as skipping a meal or failing to pay a bill on time, in just the past 12 months? Minister. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. I haven't uh, seen the Grattan Institute uh, report. Um, I I haven't seen the Grattan Institute report, so I can't confirm Order. the numbers uh, that uh, Senator Billick has put to me. I'm happy to take the question on notice. Thank you, Minister. Senator Billick, first supplementary. Thanks, um, Deputy President. The Grattan Institute report found that young Australians are in danger of being the first generation in memory to have lower living standards than their parents' generation. Is this the legacy the minister is leaving young Australians? Yep. Minister. Thank, thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. Can I just correct? I, th I think I actually have seen the report and I've met with the Grattan Institute regarding the report, so I need to correct what I've said. Um, and, and Order. 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 Please continue, Minister. And, and, and of course, the Australian government is, is extremely in concerned to ensure that young Australians have the best opportunities that they Order. have in any circumstance to get into, a, uh, get into a job and, if they slip through the cracks, to find their way through. That's, that's why the youth portfolio has been recreated, ma uh, Madam Deputy President, so that we can draw together the elements of the Australian economy uh, and the departments that uh, have oversight of areas in the youth portfolio to actually start to work through all of the issues that uh, we, can, we can deal with to prevent young people falling through the cracks in the way that the Grattan Thank Institute Thank you, Minister. The time for about. answering the question so, has expired. Senator Billick, a second supplementary. Be bearing in mind our order, Senator Ayres, I can't hear Senator Billick ask the question. Senator Billick. Bearing in mind the um, minister is not sure if he's seen the report or not, I will try for another supplementary. Given the Morrison government has refused to reverse cuts to penalty rates, isn't it clear that after six years of coalition government, young Australians are going to work harder but go backwards? Minister. Thank you, thank you Madam Deputy President. Uh, and Madam Order. Deputy President, it's clear that the Labor Party aren't listening to the answers that are given on this side from this side of the, the chamber. Given that the indexation, the, the rate of increase of wages is actually outstripping Order. the long-term average, it's clear that people aren't actually going backwards. They're actually gaining. So, so that with a great, with, with a, with a rate of growth of the economy and wages in the economy that is actually growing at a rate Order. that's higher than the out, out long-term average and growing at a rate higher than the, than the CPI in the economy, it's clear that 
people have the opportunity Order. to progress if they have work and if they have the opportunity to work in the Australian economy. Thank you, Minister. Um, Senator Macdonald. My question is to the Minister for Resources and Northern Australia. Can the Minister update the Senate on recent progress of the Adani Carmichael mine site? Yeah. Minister. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Well, I'm delighted to update the Senate on the progress uh, that's occurred at the Adani Carmichael mine, especially the progress that has occurred since the 18th of May, uh, Madam <laughs> Deputy President. The progress is going well, uh, Madam Deputy President. There are now around 150 people employed at the site at Carmichael, in outback Queensland, in fact, with a job. Uh, they're moving dirt around. About 50 different big yellow things, big pieces of uh, earth-moving equipment are there, and they have already moved a sum total of 100,000 cubic metres of dirt. Uh, producing and developing this nation-building project. Uh, the construction has started on a five-kilometre dam wall at the site too. Now, yesterday, Madam Deputy Press, yesterday I thanked the Australian Greens uh, for demonstrating the benefits of, of natural gas uh, in their hot air balloon uh, demonstration outside. I've also got another thing to thank the Australian Greens for today, because if you want more live progress of at the, at the Adani Carmichael mine site, you can just log on to Facebook and many of the uh, desperate, daily, vain Facebook live streams of anti-coal activists are there for you. And you can see in the background all the work happening at the Carmichael <laughs> site. It's continuing to happen. People have get, got a job. People have a hope. People have hope. People have a future in central yeah, yeah. Queensland thanks to this project. And uh, it's, I also welcome the fact uh, Madam Deputy President, that uh, recently Adani announced they would open an office in Rockhampton, uh, in my hometown, in, in Rocky, to, to build on the headquarters they have in Townsville, where hundreds of people are employed there. And I look forward to joining the local member, Michelle Landry, who has fought so hard for this project over the years, uh, when that office will be opened in Rockhampton. What a great day it will be uh, for Rocky to have an office uh, of a major mining company employing people not just out in the mine site but also in town, in office jobs, giving opportunities for young people in particular in central Queensland for a future so they don't have to move away just to get a job. Thank you, Minister. Senator McMahon, your first supplementary. What economic opportunities lie ahead for central and north Queensland now that construction of this project has gone ahead? Minister. Well, thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. I thank Senator Macdonald for that question as well. Uh, this uh, is, uh, as I said, going very well. This project is not just about this project, though. It is about opening up a new area of wealth generation for our nation. Uh, this will be the first coal basin in 50 years opened in this country, and that will mean that will mean more investment, more jobs. There are another five potential mines going very, through various stages of approval. All up, all up, they could deliver 16,000 direct jobs in mining and a massive increase in economic wealth and opportunity for this country. It's summed up best. Uh, Madam Deputy President, by the people who live there in central Queensland, people like Kel Appleton, who owns the Grand Hotel in Claremont. As he said, after years of tough times, the Galilee Basin is more than an opportunity for us. It's our chance to have the things that city people take for granted, That's things right. like a strong, stable income and hope for your children. People don't realise that if the mines close, so do the towns. Senator McMahon, a Second supplementary. McDonald, Senator McDonald, McDonald sorry. Yes. <laughs> My are, apologies. Are you aware of any recent developments that would undermine the coal industry in central and north Queensland and have put at risk our economy and local jobs? Minister. Well, th thank you. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Uh, well, um, uh, Madam Deputy President, uh, I, I, think that, I thought there had been some other good progress since May 18th as well, because since that date we have seen some Labor senators and Order. others some express a degree of support for the coal industry. And Senator Chisholm and, and, uh, and my, my good mate Joel Fitzgibbon, the other place, have sort of been saying they might support coal jobs now, uh, given they nearly lost their job six months ago. But now, now we see all of that was just talk. All of it was just talk no. because yesterday, Madam Deputy President, we saw the Labor Party announce that they will Order. buckle to the activists that are That's protesting right. our streets and Every declare time. a climate emergency. Every Why are they doing this, Madam Deputy President? It's because they want the preferences and the votes of the Greens over the jobs of people in regional Order. areas like central Queensland. They'll never fight for jobs, Madam Deputy President. They'll Order. never fight for your job. They'll never defend your industries. They'll always sell you out just to get a vote. 
Thank you, Senator Canavan. Order. It's done. That's it. I ask that further questions be placed on an order Thank you. Senator Fariki, I believe you're seeking the call. Yeah, thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. Pursuant to Standing Order 164.3, I seek an explanation from the Minister of Defence as to why Order for Production of Documents Number 91 has not been complied with. Uh, I believe Senator Birmingham has a response. Senator Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Madam De Deputy President, and. Uh, uh, Senator Faruqi, uh, um, uh, I, uh, I believe you will find that in relation to the uh, request made to uh, Senator Reynolds, that uh, Senator Reynolds, as the Minister for Defence, did on the 10th of September provide a response, and at that time Senator Reynolds did indicate that portfolio responsibility for the coordination of the government's response to PFAS contamination and the Australian government's response to the inquiry sits with the Minister for the Environment, uh, who I represent in this place. Um, so, Senator Faruqi, uh, uh, and, uh, and I, thank, uh, I thank your office for notice uh, of this today, which was why I had the information uh, and Senator Reynolds was caught by surprise. Um, uh, the, uh, the government does recognise that managing PFAS contamination is a complex issue. It requires an effective evidence-based, nationally consistent response, utilising the best available scientific evidence. Uh, our government's action and investment to date in responding to PFAS contamination has been extensive, including regular contact with the communities effective, affected. <laughs> Uh, the government is carefully considering the recommendations of the parliamentary inquiry into the management of PFAS contamination in and around defence bases, and we will respond as soon as possible. Uh, but, uh, obviously, Senator, your order for the production of documents of that government response has been responded to by Senator Reynolds in the context of, uh, of her letter, and I can inform you uh, that that response has not yet been finalised, and therefore we are not in a position to be able to table a response not yet finalised. Thank you, Minister. Senator Faruqi. Uh, thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. I move that the Senate take note of the Minister's explanation. Uh, minister's explanation. Senator uh, Minister, with all due respect, that just isn't good enough. Um, the Committee on uh, PFAS contamination handed down its report almost 12 months ago now, and we haven't seen a response to any one of the single recommendations made by that committee. And every day the government delays responding to this report really shows its contempt, not only for the Senate, but for the thousands of people who have lived with contamination of their lands and their water, which was actually caused by the government. It is showing contempt and disrespect for no less than 27 primarily regional communities that live near defence bases, so much for the talk of supporting regional communities by this government. And these communities are across practically every state and territory in Australia. In New South Wales alone, there are four sites under active management for PFAS and three more under investigation. And every day that the government denies compensation, it, drive the, it drives these people further into the ground financially, as well as further damaging their mental and physical health. These communities did nothing wrong their land was contaminated by the Department of Defence, but now the community is expected to bear the cost of living with PFAS contamination. Not good enough. The government needs to stop pretending that this is some kind of new issue. It isn't. The United States Environmental Protection Agency wrote to the Australian government 18 years ago, 18 years, almost two decades, to draw attention to the long-term risks of PFAS to human health and the environment. And if you read the committee's report, Minister, you will see the pain that communities are living with. This is really hurting people. People have had to delay their retirement and actually increase their work hours because of this huge financial impost. The submissions talk about stress, anxiety, and depression, and even cancers, heart attacks, pregnancy loss, and developmental issues with children. People have had to put their lives on hold. They've had to change their whole life plans. And this is heartbreaking. People are at a breaking point. The government needs to take action, and it needs to take action now. 
The inquiry in PFAS contamination was an opportunity for the community to have the government hear them and listen to them. But here we are, almost 12 months on, and the government still won't release a response. I know it's a complex issue, but usually responses come within three months. This is an urgent issue as well. Our committee made a wide range of recommendations that would go some way to resolving this issue. What exactly does the government object to? We provided recommendations around providing leadership to drive effective and transparent responses to PFAS contamination, including ongoing monitoring, identifying gaps and priorities for investigation and remediation, and to upscale investment in the containment of PFAS plumes, and to remediate contaminated land and water. We called for a coordinator general to coordinate a national response and providing a national point of contact. These are logical steps to take immediately. We also recommended legislation and policies to ban nationally the use of long-chain PFAS-based firefighting foams and contain and ultimately destroy these safely where they still exist. The Australian government should make it a matter of priority to ratify the listing of PFOS under the Stockholm Convention on Persistent Organic Pollutants. Noting that Australia is one of the only countries that have not ratified this global agreement. The committee also recommended that the Australian government assist property owners and businesses in affected areas through compensation, including the possibility of buybacks, as well as free individualized case management and financial counseling services. I've had the opportunity to meet with two PFAS affected communities again in the last few weeks in Richmond in Western Sydney and in Williamtown in The Hunter. That's since the Senate passed my order for the production of documents. I was hoping to tell these communities the good news, that the government has finally responded to our report and their needs. But instead, I had to tell them what they already knew, that the government doesn't care about them. The amazing Hawkesbury Environment Network organized a community forum for the community affected by PFAS contamination from the R Richmond RAAF base. People are angry. They are really frustrated at a lack of response from the government. They feel like the government and the Department of Defense aren't listening and taking their concerns seriously. You know, farmers are being told that their produce is too contaminated to consume themselves, so they should sell it onto the market to reduce concentration risk. Why would a producer want to sell produce they know has contaminated levels of PFAS? What kind of advice is this? Another resident questioned whether or not it was safe to give her chickens eggs to her grandchildren. People are confused and scared. And when they talk to the Department of Defense, they aren't getting the answers that they want or need. Consultation isn't just turning up and listening. It is actually about acting on what the people are saying. People want you to use the precautionary principle. People want you to take responsibility for your actions. Take blood testing, for instance. On 30th June, the government closed the voluntary blood testing program for people who live or work, or who have lived or work in the RAAF base, Williamtown, New South Wales, Army Aviation Center, Oki, Queensland or RAAF based Tyndall in Northern Territory investigation areas and who had potentially been exposed to PFAS. Now no one has access to free blood testing to monitor PFAS levels in their blood. Residents told me if they wanted their blood monitored for PFAS contamination, they had been told that they had to shell out hundreds of dollars. How is this acceptable? How is this okay? At Williamtown, they are staring down their fifth Christmas of dealing with this issue. Drive down Fullerton Cove Road and you will see sign after sign on people's properties calling out the federal government for ruining people's lives. In the red zone, which the Department of Defense now calls the primary management zone, Lindsay Cloud told me that frustration is probably a minor word. It's anger now. Outside the RAAF base on Madawi Road, resident Lyndon Dristale put it well, telling me that the government is cruel 
for leaving Port Stephens residents in limbo for almost a year since the Parliamentary Committee into PFAS contamination handed down its report calling for strong action. She said, the big people, the politicians in Canberra, don't listen to us little people. We are the ones who are living this nightmare 24-7, and we're not going to stop fighting, even if it means till the death. If you think you can get away with ignoring the people, well, you have another thing coming. You have the luxury of sitting here, wasting time and obfuscating, but they don't. The community have waited long enough. Communities have suffered long enough. I can only conclude that the government is dragging its heels to avoid facing up to its responsibilities. Stop forcing these communities to pay the cost of the government's mistakes. Comply with the order of the Senate and respond to the really good recommendations of the committee. The question is, Senator McCarthy, on the same matter? Yes, yes it is McCarthy. on the same matter. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I'd just like to put uh, uh, Labor's uh, uh, voice on the records here. I was the deputy chair of that committee, and I certainly echo the sentiments uh, of Senator Faruqi in the call to the government to respond. It is disgraceful uh, that all those families uh, in those communities that we had uh, held this inquiry from the people of Catherine uh, to Oakey in Queensland uh, to the Newcastle region and here again in Canberra, uh, they, deserve, they deserve the respect from this parliament to have a response. And it is absolutely disgraceful uh, that it is nearly 12 months since there has been a, a response from this government. I remind the parliament of some of those recommendations. Uh, that the committee recommended that the Australian government appoint a coordinator general to coordinate the national response to the PFAS contamination issue, supported by an appropriate resourced office. Uh, there were also calls in those uh, recommendations that the Australian government review its existing advice in relation to the human health effects of PFAS exposure, including to acknowledge the potential links to certain medical conditions. And also, uh, a third area of the nine recommendations that the Australian government, as soon as possible, undertake measures to improve participation in the voluntary blood testing program for PFAS. And this should include measures to increase community awareness about the purpose and importance of the tests and the associated epidemiological study. These are critical recommendations that this government has failed to act on fail to give due respect to all those families and communities who came forward in the sincere hope that our parliament would act. And we certainly echo the call for the government to move on this. Uh, certainly there is another uh, PFAS subcommittee that will be looking into this going forward, but there will be no credibility if there hasn't been that response from the government. Thank you. The question is the motion moved by Senator Faruqi be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye, against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Are there any notices of, to take notice of answers? Motions to take note of answers? Senator Thank Gallagher. You. Thank you very much. I rise to take note of answers given by Senator Cormann to the questions asked by Senator McCarthy and myself. Uh, I think uh, what we've seen today from the government is more um, denial that any of the issues facing the Australian economy have anything remotely to do with them. This is despite six years in government, uh, three terms. Uh, we're moving, whilst we've had a stable uh, finance minister through that time, we've had a number of different prime ministers, a number of different treasurers, uh, and the evidence is mounting that. I think, from experts, not just from Labor, but from the RBA, uh, from uh, eminent economists across the country, uh, from now we've got international um, groups, uh, the IMF, the WTO, all raising concerns around uh, growth in, advanced, in economies, in advanced economies and more broadly. And here we have a government that is in stubborn denial or stubborn refusal to actually do anything ab about it. Um, 
The latest document, the IMF, which relates to the question that um, Senator McCarthy and I asked questions on today, um, has rung the alarm bells, I think, again, around what's happening in the Australian economy. We've seen a very significant revision back of uh, growth that's expected. Um, We've got a whole range of other economic indicators that have come out since the election uh, that the government continues to refuse to take notice of. We've got uh, the lowest growth um, levels of growth since the GFC. Uh, we've seen living standards of Australian families in decline. Every day you listen to the radio, there's another report, whether it be around food insecurity, uh, paying the bills. Um, lack of wages growth, the real impact on families across and households across the country is being reported on a daily basis. We've got more than 1.9 million, million Australians who are looking for work or for more work. We've got a staggering level of household debt um, at 190 per cent of dis disposable income. So yes, while we've had tax cuts, the evidence to date, uh, and I know the government's placing a lot of um, emphasis on this, uh, the, set, the next quarter's results uh, would show that people are using that money to pay down debt. Uh, they are not using it to spend uh, and support growth across the economy. We've got business investment contracting, we've got consumer confidence declining, consumption growth is weak, productivity in decline. Um, these are all facts. This is all what is happening and we've got a government that just says nothing, no matter. Um, the, the plan we took to the election, despite a lot of uh, these results coming out post the election, are, is all on track. Um, well, the evidence is mounting that that is not the world in which we are living in. That is not the world in which Australians are living in. They are working harder, they are working longer, and they are going backwards. That is the reality. You talk to absolutely anyone, you will not get a story of oh, it's all great, um, we're very confident the tax cuts are going to help us. Uh, it's a very different picture. Childcare costs going up, electricity costs going up, um, um, you know, managing to afford the extras, impossible, uh, because wages aren't growing, costs are increasing, there is uncertainty about what is going to happen in the future, and the government isn't offering any hope or any plan. It's not good enough to rest on what, what you promised last year or in the lead-up to the election anymore. People want to know that you have your hands on the levers and that you are listening and acknowledging the reality of the world in which they live. That's the job of a government. It's not to be stubborn and point the finger and say it's all Labor's fault that this is happening, despite us not being in government for, unfortunately, for some time federally. That is not what Australians who even voted for you and those that didn't vote for you want to hear. They want to hear, we are aware of the world in which you are living, we are aware of the pressures, and this is what we are going to do to assist you to respond to it. And we are not getting that from uh, the government at all. Uh, we accept that you will point the finger at Labor. That's part of the show and the game that we play in this chamber. But I think, in all fairness, when we have the results that we're seeing, when we have the concern that we're seeing, when we're having the, the lack of confidence going forward and the uncertainty that it's responsible on this government to stand up and respond to current situation, not to point the finger and blame, but to accept the data, the evidence, the expert advice that is coming and respond to it. Senator Gallagher, your time Thank has you. expired. Senator McDonald. Thank you very much. I rise to take note of the debate, and in particular, I, uh, I imagine that it's probably not unusual to expect that Labor will continually talk but not listen. I think that the Prime Minister and the Leader of the House here has said on several occasions that our government has provided certainty, that we are seeing stability, we've seen a plan a plan that we took to the Australian people, a plan that we put in our budget, a plan that foresaw these challenges that Australia was going to face, and a government that's just steadfastly getting on with implementing that plan. But I guess we shouldn't be surprised that Labor, as a group who wouldn't understand the challenges of business, who wouldn't understand how serious these challenges are, and that it is 
um, expected challenges. The IMS has indeed noted the global economy is in a synchronised slowdown. It has downgraded global growth for 2019 to 3 per cent. Um, this subdued growth re reflects trade and political uncertainty, which is weighing on confidence and investment. And Australia is not immune to these challenges. Nevertheless, we remain well placed to meet these headwinds. In 2019, Australia is forecast to grow faster than any G7 economy except the US, while Germany, UK and Singapore have had negative economic growth in the June quarter. Jobs growth of 2.5 per cent through the year is stronger than any G7 economy and more than double the OECD average of 0.9 per cent compared to 0.7 per cent in 2013. And we do have a strong budget position that supports our economic resilience. Our budget is back in balance, whereas major advanced economies are averaging deficits of 3.8 per cent. And we are paying down net debt currently around a quarter of the G7 average. But again, I don't expect that Labor would understand the challenges to business and the economy. It is not in their DNA. In fact, when Senator Ayres rose to a question regarding regional unemployment in Queensland, my home state, the great home state of Queensland, I was amazed that he did not understand that unemployment in regional Queensland is a direct result of what happens when you have a Labor government. It is the Labor government in Queensland that has risen uh, the state's debt to a shocking $90 billion. That is just an extraordinary number and an, a massive noose and weight around the neck of our state. Uh, it is a state that is spending more on um, public servants' jobs than ever before. Uh, it is a state that provides no certainty to business. It is a state that increasingly regulates for any activity that businesses are trying to undertake. It is a state that constantly moves the goalposts, whether it be on mining projects or, incredibly shockingly, in this time of drought, Emu Swamp Dam, a dam that is needed urgently critically for the Stanthorpe area, and yet the state government continues to play games. It is the state Labor government in Queensland that doesn't understand how to get jobs going, how to get certainty going, how to get growth going. And I am surprised that Senator Ayres would raise that, because it is my very dear ambition that we remove the state Labor government in Queensland, yeah, yeah, yeah. because it is doing no good for our state and we know that that is where uh, uncertainty and bad economic outcomes become, uh, happen when businesses are not able to get on with the job of employing people. Uh, the economy is not some beast that magically sits in the corner of the room. It is something that happens when uh, small businesses, big businesses, people take out a mortgage, they take a risk and they employ somebody else. It is hard work. It is the sort of thing that you go to bed with a stone in your stomach. Small businesses are the backbone and the engine room of this country, and yet it is under Labor's policies that they would have taken to, that they took to the election, which would have provided increased electricity prices, increased uncertainty, massive new taxes, and increased debt for this country. So, uh, on those notes. I, um, I urge Senator Ayres to work with me to remove the state Labor government in Queensland. Thank you, Senator McDonald. Senator McAllister. Thanks, Mr Acting Deputy President. Well, for a party that claims to be big on the idea of individual responsibility, this government is surprisingly resistant to taking responsibility for its own actions. It's always somebody else's fault. Always somebody else's fault. Never the fault of the people over there. It's the unions, Greta Thunberg, the public service, the states, the crossbench. There's always somebody else to blame. Always somebody else to blame. Now they're talking points, helpfully distributed to the entire press gallery and then pretty much to every other person in Australia on Monday, littered with references to the Labor Party. Six years in talking points that talk only about the Labor Party and our previous policies, despite the fact that we are not in government and have not been in government for six years. 
So it's no surprise, no surprise to hear Mr. Minister Cormann claim responsibility uh, and say that a downgrade to Australia's growth forecast lies somewhere else, pretty much anywhere else, except with him and with the government. But unfortunately, that is just not true. Today, the IMF released its World Economic Outlook, which substantially downgraded its forecast for Australia's economic growth. And the report shows the hollowness of the government's claim that they are managing the economy just fine. Thank you very much. Instead, the IMF's analysis reinforces what we are seeing in multiple indicators across the economy. The slowest economic growth since the GFC 10 years ago. Household debt is at record highs. There are more than 2 million Australians unemployed or underemployed. Business investment, business investment, which people over there are skiting about, is the lowest it has been since the 1990 recession. Now, the government, Minister Cormann, would like to blame this on global economic headwinds, but the truth is that that answer does not stack up. It does not stack up. The Australia's downgrade is larger than that for global growth and four times larger than that for the Eurozone and the advanced economies as a whole. Our performance cannot be explained as merely just part of the global headwinds because it is so much worse than the averages in the countries we would normally compare ourselves to. The Coalition have been in power for six years now, and during that time they have overseen a stark deterioration in Australia's economy, and this is not something that is happening in the abstract. Ordinary Australians have seen their wages stagnate whilst the cost of living goes up. And it is time for the government to take responsibility. Now, that may not be politically convenient for the government, and it may not fit the chief marketer, the prime minister, his clever messaging strategy. But the government cannot pretend any longer that there is no problem. It is time for them to act. The Prime Minister, in response to all of this, has declared that he's not spooked. Well, how self-obsessed, as though the IMF's announcement was a challenge to him personally rather than a substantive policy challenge for the Australian economy. And his response indicates that his intention is to deliver more of the same, which is absolutely nothing. Unfortunately, that is not going to cut it. The Reserve Bank has cut the cash rate five times five times since 2016 to the current record low. The IMF has called on countries, including Australia, to provide fiscal stimulus and invest in infrastructure to support their economy and improve productivity. According to the IMF, monetary policy cannot be the only game in town and should be coupled with fiscal support where fiscal space is available. Well, they're far from alone. Serious economic commentators from Deloitte Access through to the Reserve Bank have been calling for fiscal responses to Australia's stagnating growth. And there are plenty of options for the government. They just need to look at the mounting pile of policy concerns, problems that they are willing to ignore at the moment. Wages policy, energy policy, an increase to New Start, infrastructure investment, a plan to stimulate business investment. All options on the table, but not on the table for this government that refuses to take responsibility for the economy. They have allowed real problems to develop in the Australian economy during their six years in office, and this is not something that the PM can fix with a pithy slogan or a tricky messaging strategy. He has to do something real. It is time for him to act. Thank you, Senator McAllister. Senator Van. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise, rise to take note of answers in question time that highlight the government's positive plan for a strong economy that creates more jobs for Australia. Mr Acting Deputy President, as Minister Cormann has stated in question time today, the fundamentals of the Australian economy remain sound. We have a AAA credit rating, record labour market participation and welfare dependency is at its lowest level in three decades. We are in our 29th year of consecutive economic growth, a record unmatched by any other developed nation. However, as the minister did outline, we do face headwinds. The IMF World Economic Outlook confirmed that global economic growth has slowed. 
with rising, and I quote, with rising trade and geopolitical tensions taking a toll on business confidence, investment decisions and global trade. IMF global growth forecasts have been downgraded by 0.3 percentage points since their April update to 3 per cent for 2019, its lowest level since 2008-2009. While Germany, the United Kingdom, Singapore and other economies experienced negative economic growth in the June quarter, the Australian economy remains resilient and continues to grow. But the international challenges are a stark reminder of why we must stick to our economic plan, which will deliver lower taxes so Australians can keep more of what they earn. More we will create more infrastructure to create jobs and boost productivity, returning the budget back to surplus so we can meet the challenges ahead. Not only is our economy strong, we are also focused on job creation. Unemployment growth is currently at 2.6 per cent, which is more than twice the OECD average and more than three times what the coalition inherited when we came to government. Labor force figures released last month by the ABS underline the continued strength of the Australian labour market, with seasonally adjusted employment increasing by 34,700 jobs, exceeding all market expectations and now stand at a record high of almost 13 million jobs in August 2019. Madam Deputy President, in my maiden speech I said the government must do as much as possible to ensure that there are few roadblocks to people being able to work. And I believe this is exactly what the coalition government is doing. A record number of Australians are in work. The participation rate has never been higher. More than 1.4 million new jobs have been created since we came to office, and around 8 out of 10 every new job is being, filled, is being a full time over the past year. The coalition government has a plan that supports the creation of more jobs, and small business plays a major role in this plan. They are the major supplier of jobs and the backbone of our economy. I wish more of those opposite had created jobs instead of being political hacks or unionists. According to the Small Business Council report released in July 2019 by the Australian Small Business and Family Enterprise Ombudsman, around 98 per cent of all, Australians, uh, of all Australian businesses have 19 or less employees. Madam Deputy President, over 230,000 small businesses have been created since 2013-2014 with 75,000 created in 2017-2018 alone. Good economic management runs in the blood of the coalition. We have a track record of delivering red tape savings. Between September 2013 and December 2016, for instance, our Cutting the Red Tape initiative resulted in $5.8 billion being reported as red tape savings. That means $5.8 billion that Australians are now investing in their business or spending elsewhere in the economy. This is good for small business, good for jobs and good for our economy. The government is also helping small business invest and grow through increasing and expanding the instant as asset write-off. This initiative now covers assets up to $30,000 for businesses under $50 million. Those on this side of the chamber are focused on ensuring that our, our strong economy is working. We are supporting small business— oh, Senator Van, your time has expired. Uh, Senator Sheldon. Good, thank you, uh, uh, Deputy, Chair, uh, Deputy President. Uh, first of all, I just want to—a uh, question to, to, um, that will put to Senator Cormley. Isn't it absolutely amazing? You know, we've, we've got them coming here, and I, I really enjoyed listening before to uh, Senators uh, before talking about the our priorities list, the Liberal Party talking sheet. Because when you start looking at some of the things that they put in their talking sheet, you can start seeing the sorts of rhetoric they use in the debate about serious economic challenges of the Australian economy. You know, the Prime Minister in their talking debate says, from our government you have seen certainty, you have seen stability, you have seen a plan, and a plan that we took to the Australian people 
a plan that we put in our budget, a plan that foresaw the challenges that Australia was going to face, and a government that just steadfastly is getting on with implementing that plan. Well, that plan has brought us to an economic growth lower than Greece. Can you, put, can you think that you could possibly turn around and put a rhetoric sheet out when you're actually having an economy growing less than Greece that's been a depress, a, in a depression for seven years and is now having a higher growth rate than Australia? You look at the growth and the slower growth rate that we have than the US, Spain, New Zealand. Now, you know, I like a bit of competition with the Kiwis. I've got a brother-in-law who's a Kiwi. But they're beating you. I mean, there is a big difference. They've got a Labor government, so you know, that's the first you know, reason why they've got a good thought about how to actually move, it, move their economy forward. But unfortunately, this government doesn't have a plan. They have a plan about talking about a plan they don't have. Because their plan, if it exists, doesn't rate with the RBA. They've downgraded growth doesn't rate with the OECD because they've downgraded growth again for Australia. It doesn't work for the IMF because they've downgraded growth for Australia as well. That's the trifecta. What's clear and that is that we're having a situation in this country where people are under incredible stress because of the mismanagement by this government of this economy and their failure to turn around and say and recognise the seriousness of the challenges that we're facing. The Australian public are fully aware, but the government doesn't seem to be. Unemployment in Australia is now at 5.3 per cent. Youth unemployment in Australia is now twice that, a whopping 11.7 per cent, and in some regional areas it is as high as 20 per cent. Underemployment is now a disgraceful 8.5 per cent and youth underemployment at 20.9 per cent. But don't worry, they have a plan. Well, the plan's not working. The OECD is telling you, the RBA has been telling you for months, and of course the IMF have blown the whistle on you about the fact that you've failed to act in a way that is economically responsible. What's clear in the future of this plan from the government. Here's some of the things that they put in their talking points on the 14th of October. Lower taxes so you can keep more of what you earn. Well, bring the tax cuts forward. We need to actually turn around and stimulate the economy. They put point two, reduce the cost of doing business. Energy? Well, there's no plan there. Deregulation? Finance? Well, we've seen the Banking Royal Commission and we're still waiting for the fulsome of the plan. No plan there. And this is the one I really and really find absolutely disgraceful. Getting paid on time. This is point two of their two points of their big plan. Well, you only have to talk to small business. I had the pleasure of being representing an organisation prior to being here for what is the largest small business organisation in this country. In actual fact, larger than probably all the other small businesses organisations put together representing owner-drivers. About getting paid on time, the only people that have turned around and stopped the payment on time is this government, because the average payment on time is 240 days for trucking companies in various parts of the economy. It's averaging 90, 120 days in other parts of the economy. That the time for waiting to be paid is blowing out. And yet this was the government and the previous Turnbull government that turned around and got rid of paid time for owner drivers of 30 days. Thank you, Senator days. Sheldon. Your time has expired. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Gallagher. Did you want to speak on the same matter? On this matter. Okay. Thank you, Senator Bernard. Thank you, um, Madam Deputy President. I rise to speak on this matter because I'm struck by the lack of economic literacy, by those who stick to their talking points without any semblance of self-examination as to what their contribution has been to the lack of economic confidence that is in the broader community. There is no doubt about that. But it is because the political circus, which has been fuelled by an opposition that has always sought to get its own way, a previously 
rudderless or lacklustre leadership in the Liberal Party and a motley bunch of crossbenchers. And when Senator Gallagher said she's not going to point the finger, I thought someone has to point the finger. Someone has to say who is responsible for this. They've been warned time and time again that every time they whack more borrowed money into funding additional childcare, the cost of childcare goes up. Do not now complain that it's unaffordable. Do not come to us and say the answer to the economic problems in this country is for the government to borrow more money to boost the wages of public servants or the unemployed. You can get the same result by minimising the size of government, by cutting taxes. But why can't we cut taxes in this country? Because the socialists on the other side of the chamber will not allow it to happen. And these self-same socialists, Madam Deputy President, the self-same socialists are now trumpeting Greece and Spain as somehow the saviours of the economic growth of the world. These were bankrupt economies that had to be bailed out to the tune of hundreds of billions of dollars. And you know why? Because in Greece they had cradle-to-grave welfare where people would retire at 36 for 40 or 50 years on a fully state-funded pension. And in Spain, well, the renewable experiment that they've foisted upon us bankrupted the country. In Spain, such was the, was the extent of the subsidies for renewable energy, solar energy, they would pay to run diesel generators to put lights on at night to generate supposedly solar power. This is the utopian ideal that we are getting peddled by those who now don't want to point the finger, but will celebrate that these countries go from negative growth, where they're absolutely bankrupt, to suddenly having a glimmer of light because there's some fiscal responsibility applied to them as, as the great panacea and the great model for the rest of us. Well, the buck actually has to stop somewhere, and the buck has to stop with some critical self-examination of the policies that have been put forward by the Labor Party, by the Greens Party and by some of the more left-wing subsidists in the Liberal Party over the last decade or so. Senator McAllister made the point that the Liberal Party and the Coalition is meant to be the party of individual responsibility. Well, so they are. People can make determinations about what to do with their money and they will act in their best interest. And what are they deciding now? Their best interest is to actually pay down debt because they know it is low interest rates, uh, it is a buffer for future problems, it is a savings for a rainy day. Now, any normal-minded person would say if it's good for a household to pay down debt and if there are demands for states to pay down debt, wouldn't it be advantageous for a federal government or a Commonwealth government to actually pay down debt rather than just continue to rack it up at the tune of $50 billion a year like it started under the, the Rudd-Gillard governments? It was only a decade or so ago we had zero national debt in this country, and now all of a sudden we're on the, on the hook to the tune of $550 billion. The first glimmer of hope that we have is that the fact that the morrison frydenberg government is going to deliver a very modest surplus in this year. And those on the other side want to hijack that and take that away. They're robbing from the future to pay for their excesses of today. It's time to say enough is enough. We've got to get government to live within its means. We have to take our medicine for the failures of this place over the last decade or so. Because every time someone says the answer to a bad government program is to pump more money into it, we're stealing from our children and our grandchildren. We are stealing from the future. And I've lost track of the number of times that everyone goes, I can't support this program because there's not enough money going into it. Well, measure the effects of what you've delivered. You've delivered uncertainty to a community. You've delivered debt levels that are unprecedented. You've delivered lower literacy and numeracy rates than we've ever seen. You've delivered the most expensive electricity that we've had in the history of this country. And it's all because they will not deal with the reality Thank you, of Senator Bernardi. Your time has expired. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Gallagher to take note be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Hanson Young uh, jumped up first, Senator Hanson. Uh, uh, Madam uh, Deputy President, I just seek leave to uh, give a reflection on the questions asked by uh, the answers given to me by Senator Mackenzie. 
Ms. Lee, granted, leave is granted for three minutes, Senator Hanson. Thank, thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. Well, yesterday I was in this place and I asked the leader of the government uh, in the Senate, uh, Senator Cormann, about the impact on uh, drought on farming communities and the fact that building dams was not a policy that would help uh, the struggling farmers today or indeed uh, help the uh, river system in the months and years to come. And today I asked the minister representing the Minister for Water and Drought, Senator Mackenzie, uh, whether this government uh, will finally accept the link between uh, climate change and drought. Um, and yet we did not get a straight answer, Madam Deputy President. What we have seen is that this government continues to have their head buried in the sand when it comes to climate change, when it comes to drought and when it comes to the emergency that we are in. Um, the only thing this government wants to do is tell people that pray for rain and we'll build some dams so that next time there's a drought we might be okay. Well, it is not a plan for the future and it is not a plan for struggling farmers and our struggling river system today. The reason we are in a crisis in the Murray-Darling Basin uh, is threefold. Uh, greed, corporate greed, people taking too much water out of the system and leaving none for anybody else. Cotton, because we shouldn't be uh, spending all of our water uh, making uh, cotton seasons happen all year round, every year, in the middle of a drying climate. And of course, climate change. And what is making climate change worse? Madam Deputy President, is coal. Coal, coal, coal. So if you want to know why the Murray-Darling Basin is so stuffed, it's climate change, it's coal and it's corporate greed. These are the reasons why our farmers are struggling. And this government has it, its head in the sand. They've got no idea what to do because they have no plan for dealing with climate change. And if you don't have a plan for climate change, you don't have a plan for managing the drought. That's the truth. Uh, it's uh, just unthinkable uh, that this government continues uh, to pretend to farming communities, to the Australian community more broadly, that there is nothing that they can do. Uh, they are turning a blind eye to the obvious. The science is telling us very, very clearly that we have to get serious about reducing carbon pollution, uh, get out of coal if we are to do anything about reducing the impact of dangerous global warming. And that means if we want to stop future droughts, not just building drams, Madam Acting Deputy President, but actually stopping climate change. That is what will help. Thank you, Senator Hanson Young. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Hanson Young to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it.